From the Weston A. Price Foundation, welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. And now here is our host and producer, Hilda Labrada Gore. Hey, Hilda here. Why would a successful businesswoman leave her day job in the tech industry to start cooking from scratch, buying hens and later sheep and goats, start a homestead and write a cookbook? This is episode 469, and our guest today is Sophia Nguyen Eng. Sophia is the author of The Nourishing Asian Kitchen and the host of the Call to Farms podcast. Today, she tells the story behind the book and the podcast and this completely different lifestyle shift that she made. She covers her family's health issues and how the work of Sally Fallon Morell inspired her to put down on paper her own cultural culinary traditions. She also gets specific about favorite childhood dishes, which recipe to try out in her book if you want to give Asian cooking a crack, where we might want to start making shifts in our own kitchens toward real food, and why eating out for Asian food may not be the best way to go. Before we get into the conversation, do you ever wonder about the safety of raw milk or about its availability where you live? Go to realmilk.com, a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation. Realmilk.com is a source of reliable information on real raw milk. There are articles, blog posts, videos, and podcasts that explain why raw milk is healthy, its amazing benefits, and where you can go to obtain it in the United States. You'll also find insights on the politics and economics of the dairy industry. Go to realmilk.com. This is Hoda Labrada Gore, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Welcome to Wise Traditions. Yes, isn't this fun? Okay, so we are doing a special version of the podcast with members as part of the scene here. I'm so thankful for each of you. You know, it's members that keep the Weston A. Price Foundation going. They are the backbone with their membership of every year. It's only like $40, 30 if you use the code POD10 and you help us do this education, research, and activism, which is so important related to food, farming, and the healing arts. And today we have the privilege of welcoming to the show, <laughs> Sophie Eng, the author of Nourishing Asian Kitchen. Welcome, Sophie. Hi, Hilda. So glad to be here. I'm glad you're I'm here glad. too. So I wanted to ask you, you once had a high paying corporate job out in California Sophie, I understand that you were once working in the tech field out in California, and now you're a homesteader and an author. What shift did and why? It was because of that high paying corporate job that I let my passion project sit on the back burner for so long. What shifted for me was the events that happened around 2020 and being in California and the Bay Area specifically and realizing that. We were having our groceries delivered to us in the Bay Area through an app called Instacart and Whole Foods. I was very dependent on Whole Foods, getting all of our food delivered to us within the hour and thinking that with this modern technology, we were pretty much insulated. But it wasn't until March 16th in 2020 that I realized when all the grocery stores shut down that we really did not have security in our food system. And that's what did it for us. I had already found nourishing traditions and started eating clean 12 years prior when my daughter was born. And that's how we went down this path. But it wasn't until that moment that, you know, we went on March 16th during lockdowns and curfews and when that hit California and found a woman north of San Francisco in Mill Valley, and she sold egg laying hens at that time. And so we left that night on the 16th and drove. We bought three egg laying hens for $300 each. Did you know anything about hens before that? Not at all. We had no coop prepared. We brought them home in a cardboard box, but I had my parents quarantined with us, our children and my sister quarantined with us. And when everything shut down, it became a real moment. See, my parents were immigrants from Vietnam. They left Vietnam during the fall of Saigon in 1975 And I grew up with stories about the fall of Saigon and lockdowns and curfews. And as a child who was born and raised in America, I 
would hear these stories and I would tell my mom to stop telling us these stories because it was scary and it was never going to happen in America. And of course, you know, nearly 40 years later, this came down to us in the Bay Area and I sat both my parents down and asked them, okay, it was a humbling moment, but please sit down and tell me what happened in Vietnam. And so that's what kind of really catapulted me from being dependent on the grocery stores in Silicon Valley to then starting our own farm now. And, you know, fast forward three years later, we've now traded those three hens for ourselves to now three dairy cows where we are pretty much self-sufficient on our homestead. The cows feed us with milk, uh, with our raw milk, our dairy products, yogurt, ice cream, butter, to our animals that we clabber the milk for the chickens and then any leftover whey, we pour it out into the garden. But even more importantly, we are able to provide real nourishing food for our community. So my mom has had atrial fibrillation. She even had a TIA. She had congestive heart failure. So all of mom's health issues were always around heart. She had hypertension in her 50s. And I just remember that was part of her normal day. My dad suffered from a major depression and OCD, and, and that's actually one of the reasons why I was pre-med in college and then went to get my master's in clinical psychology because all of the doctors at Stanford University in the Bay Area just couldn't really help him with any of the SSRIs. And of course, you know, now in this industry, as I've learned more and more going through and learning about, you know, what we know, what we know now, I realized that that wasn't the right path. Um, my husband, Tim, suffered from eczema his entire life, and it was a very slow, I'd say, you know, I'd say 12-year progress. It wasn't until I had my first daughter when she was born at six months when we were starting to introduce solid foods, it was looking at these baby cookbooks that I was handed down and specifically around how to make applesauce because in our culture, we just didn't cook our fruit. And it was just as simple as what do I, how do I make applesauce? Because I didn't want to go to the grocery store. I couldn't, I didn't have it in myself to eat the baby's applesauce at the, at the grocery store that was brown and gray. I'm like, if I can't eat this, I don't know how I could feed this to her. <laughs> so I had to start from scratch and learn how to make applesauce. But it was through these cookbooks that said, and they weren't even health focused. It was like from William Sonoma. And it said, make sure that you source organic apples to make applesauce because the baby's body is not yet developed enough to process the toxic, harmful chemicals from herbicides and pesticides. And I Whoa. thought, yeah. And so I thought, yeah. that's interesting. That's fine. I'll go to Whole Foods and buy the organic apples for her to make applesauce. But at what point will her body be able to digest and process these? harmful toxins. Um, and of course, you know, 12 years later, here we are with our own farm and growing our own beyond organic apples and <laughs> making our own food and raising our own animals because I realized that our bodies were never designed to process these harmful toxins. Wow. I can't believe that was in a William Sonoma cookbook. That's wild. <laughs> I know. Now you're talking about making applesauce. What foods were you raised on? Were you raised on traditional Vietnamese cuisine? Yes, I was. My mom and dad worked full time. My mom at one point worked two full time jobs. And so my grandparents lived about a block away from us. And so I spent a lot of my after school time with my grandparents. And then whenever mom was home, I spent a lot of time with her in the kitchen because that's all she would be doing when she was home is in the kitchen or I'd hop in the car and go to the grocery store with her. But I grew up with eating traditional Vietnamese food. And then as I grew up and we started, I mean, we're in the Bay Area, so we're in the Mecca of a lot of the diverse cuisine. So we're kind of spoiled. I got to eat a lot of, you know, different Thai, Chinese, Indian, <laughs> all of the other Japanese, Korean. Oh my gosh, when I was pregnant, that's all I was craving was Korean food. So wow. a lot of diverse Asian cuisine and, you know, growing up in the Bay Area, but none of it was based off of nourishing traditions. We had cooked from scratch at home, but we were still heavily dependent on the Asian condiments at the grocery store. And but wait, aren't those condiments traditional? Not the way that they were sold to us in the Asian grocery stores. There's a lot of preservatives, a lot of flavor additives in there. 
and they have to be to be shelf stable. And I didn't realize that until I found Nourishing Traditions at the same time that I found Food Babe that really talked about MSG. And that opened up my eyes to realize, wait a minute, this might be causing what mom is suffering through. Whenever we went out to the restaurants and we would have our Asian food there, if we didn't cook it at home, we ate outside, she would come back with reactions all the time. And heart reactions, I, like heart arterial fibrillation? Yes, palpitations. And she would just say, I'm so tired, I can't walk. And I realized that I hadn't realized before that, that there was a direct correlation between us eating out and her heart problems. Wow. Yeah. And did she start to put two and two together? I put it together. And <laughs> it was one day where I spent going into the the kitchen, I took out a garbage bag, a black, one of those big black garbage bags. And I went one by one through our pantry and then through the refrigerator. And I turned it around and I started throwing these glass jars into this garbage bag. And mom came running out and she said, what are we supposed to cook with then if you're going to throw all of these away? And I said, I don't know, but we'll figure it out. And so that's why in the cookbook, I started with the sauces because those are the basic condiments that we needed to start with to replace one by one all of our recipes. And Sophie, I know in your book, you said it was a 12-year journey to bring this cookbook to fruition. I can't help but notice that your child was born about 12 years ago. So was she an influence and how did the cookbook start to take shape? She was the influence. She was the one that opened up my eyes. I found nourishing traditions when my husband was deployed. His last duty station was at Kirtland Air Force Base. And there was a family of eight that lived in the Tejeras Mountains. And it was a co-worker of his. So we went up to the mountains and we visited them. And we were in our early 20s. This was before children. (laughs) And she had eight children. They had their own dairy cow. And she had me try raw milk for the first time. And I remember thinking, oh, gosh, this is how I'm going to (laughs) die. But she had told us that this yellow book written by Sally Fallon Morell was what changed her life and her family's life. And I flipped through it. I was expecting photos and didn't see any, but still I said, "Okay, I'll go home and buy this book. But it wasn't until I had my daughter that, you know, that applesauce was what did it for me. And because of the applesauce and looking into the chemicals that brought me back to nourishing traditions and realizing, hey, there might be something that I can learn from this book. But as I started cooking nourishing traditions recipes at home, mom and dad were missing the umami flavors. And the umami flavors are one of the five basic tastes, along with, you know, your sweet, sour, bitter, and salty. It's the savory taste that they wanted. And that's very indicative in, you know, long fermented foods like miso, fish sauce, soy sauce. And so slowly I said, okay, well then let me start replacing what you guys are used to eating, but using Weston A. Price principles. And that's kind of what started this journey. And Throughout the 12 years that I had done, started cooking alongside mom and replacing all of our recipes to be more Weston A. Price and Nourishing Traditions inspired, I started thrifting the dishware. And all of the dishware that I have in the cookbook today have been thrifted throughout the last decade where I had dreams of one day writing a cookbook with mom. But with all the money that I was making and my successful career in tech, It just didn't make any financial sense to take off time to write a cookbook. And it wasn't until mom and dad turned 75 um, last year that I said, okay, if I don't write this down now, mom's memory might wane. And here I am standing in the gap between mom and the children. And then if I don't write this down, it's all going to go when mom goes. So I took the time off and we spent over a year writing the book. I was only supposed to take three months off because in the tech industry, you don't want to take that much time off, especially, of course, as I took the time off, AI has now come into the play. And, you know, it's just been having to learn how to navigate through that and still stay relevant. Coming up, Sophie answers the question, Why should we cook from scratch in the first place? Can't we just eat nourishing Asian food in a restaurant? You're listening to the Wise Traditions Podcast from the Weston A. Price Foundation. We pause now to recognize our sponsors. Optimal Carnivore. 
Brain Nourish is a revolutionary new product from the guys over at Optimal Carnivore. They have combined grass-fed beef brain and lion's mane mushrooms in a groundbreaking formula. It is the ultimate whole food nootropic to build a better brain. These two ancestral superfoods have been used for centuries to improve brain function and overall mental well-being. They are now available for the first time together in convenient capsules. Studies have shown that these superfoods are great for supreme focus, elevated mood, improved memory, greater clarity, and enhanced creativity. So go to amazon.com slash optimal carnivore and use the code WESTIN10 to get 10% off all products, including Brain Nourish and other products. And remember that Optimal Carnivore plants one tree for every product sold, so that helps the environment. Again, go to amazon.com slash optimal carnivore and use the code WESTIN10. In Paleo Valley, they have an apple cider vinegar complex that can give you all the healing properties of apple cider vinegar without all the fuss or the burn. Why take it? Well, apple cider is known to support digestion, breaking down proteins for better absorption, and it improves blood sugar response, helping to fight cravings. The main ingredient, acetic acid, supports in extracting nutrients from food for use by the body. Paleo Valley combines apple cider vinegar and its beneficial properties with other healing spices like turmeric, ginger, cinnamon, and lemon for added digestion benefits. Clinically proven benefits include improved blood pressure, reduced risk of heart disease, as well as being helpful for pre-diabetics and T2 diabetics. Apple cider vinegar supplementation may also be helpful with muscle cramps and satiety. So the question is, why not take it? Go to paleovalley.com slash wise to get 15% off your first order. Whether you choose to get the apple cider vinegar complex or any of the other Paleo Valley products, you can't lose. Just go to paleovalley.com slash wise again to get 15% off your first order. This is Hilda Labrada Gore and you're listening to Wise Traditions. So what was a dish, Sophie, that you were like, mom, we have to put this one in, like a dish that you love, that your parents love, that your kids love? It's the beef oxtail pho. It's on the cover of the Nourishing Asian Kitchen. <laughs> ah, yeah. can you tell us a little bit about what goes into that and what makes it so nourishing? Well, it's a perfect combination of slow cooked oxtail, uh, tender brisket, and rare eye of round, which is cooked when you pour the hot broth over it. Um, I love the pickled onions, and my dad will af- often add a raw egg yolk in there. And so that's all represented in that cookbook cover. But it's part of our family. It's, you know, in that photo, I actually cried as I was taking that photo and putting that dish together for the cover because. It's everything that's representative of our family, the way that we love to eat. I love the wider rice noodles in there. My dad with the eggs and the rare beef, the girls love that. And it's such a hearty broth and very healing. It was one of the first dishes that I asked after I gave birth and in my postpartum period in our culture, we have something that's called the fourth trimester where the mom is her only job and sole job is to rest. And at this point where your mother-in-law or your mother comes to the house and they cook for you 24-7 and it's often broth and healing broths. And so that was the first dish that I remember asking for was I just wanted a hearty beef oxtail pho. And that's uh, on the cover of the book now. Oh my gosh, I love it so much. And I recently actually had an oxtail dish with my cousin from Cuba. I feel like it's one of those ways in which traditional cultures would honor the whole animal literally nose to tail, right? Yes, absolutely. And if you realize, I mean, the oxtail is, there's only one tail per cow. And if you raise it like we do, grass-fed and grass-finished, that takes us two years, 24 months to get that one oxtail. And so it's so special. I Now on this side, as being a farmer and a homesteader and realizing all the love and care that goes into raising our animals we don't want to waste anything. And it goes back to what I grew up with, living with mom and dad and having to grow up this way and eating nose to tail because we that was what we could afford at the time. We couldn't afford to throw away and be wasteful. Right. And speaking of your parents, when you introduced the Nourishing Traditions ideas, did it resonate with them? Were they like, oh yeah, we ate like this back in Vietnam? Like you said, your mom was kind of scandalized when you were throwing out all the 
ingredients and spices, but did she understand, oh yeah, we ate differently back in Vietnam? Yes. Yeah. That was, I mean, that's part of this book was just capturing all those stories and her realizing that this is how we ate. This is how her grandparents ate. And then coming to America, I remember things like having our, what is it? Those uh, gummy bears at the bulk section at Safeway. And I remember as a kid, I just wanted to buy the red gummy bears were my favorite. And she would tell me, you have to pick the clear ones. I'll let you eat it, but you can only pick the clear ones because she was very skeptical about the food coloring and preservatives in it. And this is her not really reading much English or having access to any scholarly research articles, but just knowing that this wasn't what she grew up with. This isn't what was you know, accessible to her then and questioning what we were doing to our food here in America. Wow. Now, Sophie, was there one recipe that she was insistent appear in the book? She says the pho. The pho is is hers. Um, her favorite are the shrimp fritters, the sweet potato fritters. And she had so many stories about how as a little girl in Vietnam, there were, this was a street food and she would sneak behind and always ask the, the <laughs> vendor there if she could have some. And some days she didn't have the money, but he would just give her some of these shrimp, uh, sweet potato fritters for her. And it was just sweet to have her relive those memories and capture them. Um, but that, when, every time I said, they're not my favorite, <laughs> <laughs> they're in the cookbook. So just remember that. Now, your husband, Tim, he's from Taiwan, right? Yeah, his mom was from Taiwan. Tim uh -huh. is actually second generation. Okay. So I'm first generation, meaning I was born here in America. And he's second generation. His dad was born here in America. And so it's funny because he grew up on rice aroni. He grew up on lean cuisine. I mean, a lot of our early disagreements and arguments when we first got married was around food. Oh, yeah. So he he was that far removed from it all. What helped him come around? Because I know there are a lot of people who reach out to us and say, I'm into this, but my husband is not. Talk to us about how things changed for him. Yeah. I mean, I came in when we first got married and I hadn't realized, you know, when we were dating, it was fine. But then we were married and he was eating two scoops of ice cream with a side of Coke and a bag of Doritos almost on the daily. It was, again, fine when we were dating long distance, but then we got married. I was like, hey, I don't think this is healthy and we sh you shouldn't be eating this. And I remember what he said to me. He said, why are you taking away my joy? And it was that in that moment that I realized, okay, there is a um, huge emotional component to this and much larger than what I think, because I come from what my grandfather always said to me, was eat to live, do not live to eat. And I always carried this notion of food as medicine. And so here I am watching someone that I love, mm. um, like abuse himself with it. So it was really hard, but it wasn't until, again, we were in Albuquerque at Kirtland Air Force Base. There was this one restaurant that we went to and we went on a date night and we tried grass-fed, grass-finished beef. It was the very first time. And we came home that night and typically... I would wake up in bed in the middle of the night sometimes thinking that we were having an earthquake. Because again, I grew up in California and that's what <laughs> we were always mm -hmm. trained to think. Like whenever you wake up or with something shaking, it's an earthquake. Well, I many, many nights um, in our early marriage, I remember I would wake up thinking, oh gosh, it's an earthquake. Turn over and find out it was Tim scratching in bed. And so I would hit him and say, oh my gosh, like what is going on? But that night when we had our date night and we tried grass-fed, grass-finished steak, he didn't scratch that night. And that was a moment where I told him, hey, there might be something to this because even that like you just didn't scratch. And then I realized just because I may not have this issue with eczema, it must be affecting me in some other way as well by eating this way. And just to go back to say in our culture or the way that I grew up, my mom would say, go and buy the USDA choice meat at the Asian grocery store. That was the best premium meat that you could buy at the Asian grocery store. So we thought that that was good enough. But come to find out now, even when I learn about grass-fed, grass-finished beef, I'm learning so much more as a farmer now. I actually have to ask our local farmers, what are you spraying on the grass? Because even though they're grass-finished, some of these farmers will say, oh, we just spray graze on. 
Grazon is just another, if not worse, form of Roundup and having glyphosate in our grass-fed, grass-finished beef. And so this is why we farm now. And this is why I want to talk about this, because a lot of people don't know about what goes into our what our food is even eating. Yeah. Some people say you are not just you are what you eat. You are what you eat eats. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Sourcing is important. And if people can't homestead, of course, here at the foundation, we have chapter leaders all around the world where people can connect with them to find sources of real food and and ask those questions that you are asking. I think it's really, really important. And so one question I have for you is, I mean, I got your cookbook. I did a few recipes and they were amazing, but it was also a lot of effort. So why cook from scratch? Why not just... Um, I don't know, hire somebody or or go back to Whole Foods and do Instacart because, you know, that sourcing is pretty good anyway. It is. It's through those questions that I realized that if I want to know exactly where my food comes from, I've got to do it myself. Or because we live rurally, it's not as easily accessible anymore to us. So for example, you know, down to the grass-fed, grass-finished, like I was saying, but even pasture-raised, um, our chicken I clab, I go the extra mile because I realize that when we can, now that we have cows, why not clabber the milk? Clabbering the milk is basically fermenting the milk to turn it into a yogurt for the chickens. So I'm improving our chickens' gut health. Right? And it's just, I just continue to go down all of these rabbit holes and realizing, okay, well, now I feel like if we just go back to the land, if we go back to farming the way that it was intended for us to be and to live. One, I mean, being in a community of other people who also farm this way, who also honor the animal and being with others that, you know, we can't do it all of ourselves. So it's great to be able to trade and barter with others in our community. And it's just so great to operate from this place of abundance and to be able to share with others all of our extras, any of our extra milk, any of our extra butter and ice cream. And if anybody's sick in our area, I bless them with bone broth because we have that. We have our chickens. We have chicken feet. We have an endless supply of bones that we can do this. And it's just a different lifestyle now that I don't think I can go back anymore. I've gone too far down. <laughs> <laughs> well, and... um I really like what my friend Hillary Boynton says, the author of the Heal Your Gut Cookbook. She says, simplicity is gourmet. So people don't have to get too fancy. When you talk about pho, that is that kind of broth and that that soup has nourished people for so long and it doesn't have to be complicated. And speaking of that, Sophie, which of the recipes in your book do you think is the simplest for people to try who want to give Asian cooking a crack? Yeah, this is great. This is the pho yeah, or the chicken pho is the number one recipe that I recommend everybody try because even as a busy mom, I still work. We homestead, we homeschool, we do all the things that and if this is something that I can get done in an hour and a half with just five minutes of active preparation time, anybody can do this. It's as simple as using a whole broiler chicken that you can purchase from Whole Foods or your small local farm, put it in 12 quarts of water, we have an organic pho spice mix that's using all of the, the mixes that goes into our pho, but it's all non-ETO, non-sprayed, all organic. That is, we have that in a, a spice pack that you can just tie, put it in there, set it and forget it with some ginger and some onion. And within an hour and a half, you have the most nourishing chicken pho broth. And I just released a pho masterclass to teach just this because it is so simple that anybody can do it. And I teach it so that my 12-year-old can now do it and my husband can do it too. <laughs> That's awesome. Now let's go back a little bit. I want to ask about your husband's health and your mom and dad's health because you said they were impetuses for this change. What changes have you noticed as you've shifted to homesteading? Uh, it has improved drastically. Dad and Tim have had PTSD. Both are war veterans. And my husband, ever since we brought home the livestock 
the goats. I mean, he's had the goat on a lead. He's walked the goat <laughs> when we first got her. And so, you know, it's been a very healing experience. When we first got into homesteading, he brought home a hundred ducklings. And it was so adorable to watch because they would imprint on him as the mom. He would just spend time with them. And, you know, I called them his little soldiers. And dad would be out there regardless of his OCD. He still went out there and fed the animals and he wanted to. So I think there was a lot of healing there on the PTSD side. For mom, she just has so much joy. I literally have the garden right outside the back door and we're using permaculture principles. So that's what I call zone one because that's where she goes in and out the most of. And it's very interesting because, you know, I'll just rinse out a jar, but she would say, rinse out the jar and she'll walk down the steps to just pour it down into the soil because that's feeding the soil microbes that increases the nutrient density for our vegetables and our grass. So there's just so much healing. Mom's health has improved drastically. We've gotten off uh, a lot of the medication. She has not had atrial fibrillation in several years now, and we've reversed her congenitive heart failure. Wow. And apart from the health conditions, it sounds like kind of rolling up your sleeves and returning to these wise traditions have blessed your family almost in ways you can't quite quantify. Exactly. And with this book, if we hadn't doubled down and moved out here, moved our farm out to, we're now in the Appalachian Mountains, to just slow down and to live intentionally. Because even while we were in California, it was really hard for us to really slow down. I think we were starting to take the beginning steps. But once we moved out here, it was saying yes to going back to the land and embracing it more and saying yes to our dreams and putting things that I was putting back on the back burner, like this cookbook. And even though I can't quantify the success of it, it's offered me these opportunities to share our story and to inspire a lot of families and individuals around the world that I never would have imagined. And even being here and having this conversation with you, Hilda. And don't you even have a podcast too, Sophie? We do. We have a podcast called The Call to Farms, and it's a play on our answering the call to arms, right? That's but so it's so cute. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, yeah, we're ex military family and we want to help others who are want to be inspired to embrace this lifestyle, either, you know, supporting our small local farmers and really understanding where our food comes from. A lot of the, you know, my husband's a homesteading realtor and I do lending as well. And so I truly feel, and I see on the lending side, our small farmers are getting squeezed out, our homesteaders as well. And just last month, actually in December, we had ended up purchasing another 22 acres just to keep our local small farmers that farm the way that we do. They had reached out to us because they were leasing land and were getting kicked off and had come to us to try to get financing and try to purchase a homestead. But they just couldn't because they're on 1099 income like most of us are. We have to have another job outside of the home to keep a homestead or to keep a farm, at least in the beginning years. And then they had just opened up a farm store, which we had found them through the farm store. And I just, because I'm a Weston A. Price chapter leader, I wanted to ask, come and ask them all the questions and they were doing everything right. And there was nothing I could do to get them financing. We really, Tim and I came back and we were like, what do we do? We cannot afford to have them leave. I mean, we can do the best that we can, but we wanted to keep our small farmers in case we don't have enough. We can Absolutely. We happily support them. And so- Help me understand, because I don't have this big financial mind. When you say they're getting squeezed out, you mean they're not making enough income from their farm store. They don't have a financially sustainable source of income. So they were at risk of losing the farm altogether. Is that what you mean? Absolutely. So as a 1099 employee or self-employed employee, I need to use two years of income and I needs to be increasing income. If there's decreasing income over the most recent year, I can't qualify And so I had asked, okay, well, let me see what your farm income has brought in. Well, they had just opened up their farm four months prior, and that's not enough for me to be able to use that income. On top of that, down payment on land is pretty pricey. And so a lot of factors come in, and if they don't have enough, I just couldn't get them qualified. And I, as a mortgage broker, have access to 150 different banks and could not get them qualified. So this is where Tim and I said, I think this is an opportunity for us to step in and be a lender in this position and take the risk for them to now lease the farm from us and for them to continue to build out their farm store. 
And of course, not everyone can do that. But I want to say the Weston A. Price Foundation is always encouraging the 50-50 pledge, inviting people to find their local farmers and spend at least 50% of their food budget supporting them. Because like you said, if we don't, they could go under and then our all of our food is at risk, right? So Absolutely. we talk about the larger infrastructure being fragile, which we saw in 2020 and 2021. In other words, we couldn't get meat shipped across the country. And so we were losing some opportunities there, but the smaller is at risk as well. And so we need to put kind of our money where our mouth is and support these local farmers who are doing it right. Absolutely. And the cost of land continues to rise over time. So we're squeezing small families who want to start this way, or especially small farmers who want to grow. It is There's a lot of costs and resources that go into it. And I didn't realize it until we became homesteaders and now small farmers ourselves. All right. I just have a couple more questions to ask you before we wrap up. One is, when you were homesteading, or you said, okay, you learned about cooking and nourishing your family from nourishing traditions. So you had Sally as a resource. Where did you go when you wanted to get land and have more than the chickens? Like, where did you turn for some instruction in case anyone right now is inspired and is like, okay, I want to leave my day job. I want to start my own homestead, at least to have some resources to family. Who did you turn to? Joel Salatin actually spoke at Google headquarters in 2010. And, you know, he, yes. And he talked about how Google should have chicken coop right outside the cafeteria. So instead of taking all of the dump or the compost and driving it through diesel trucks to the other, you know, the other side to the dumpster and wasting all of the, all of that energy into it, why not just have a chicken coop right outside and have the compost go to the chickens and then the chickens make their eggs and feed the cafeteria. And I thought, well, that's a really novel idea. (laughs) And so, of course, I didn't realize that 12 years later, here we go. Actually, no, 10 years later, here we go. When 2021 hit and we were thinking about really doubling down and becoming chicken farmers ourselves because, you know, we were being threatened left and right. We said, okay, well, the the one thing that we can do is raise chickens. So we went to Joel Salatin's farm for three times in 2021 and got hands-on training. We learned how to properly raise our chicken, butcher them, came home and implemented it right away. We started harvesting our own animals and, you know, it just grew from there. They say that chickens are the gateway animal and it is so true. (laughs) Wow. All right. So I promised you just a couple of questions, but maybe I'll toss this one in too. You hinted at it earlier, Sophie, when you said that your mom would have the heart palpitations when you ate out. Why shouldn't we just go to Asian restaurants to eat that food? If it's, you know, let's say there's a pho or whatever, like why is that not quite comparing to the quality of the home cooked Asian meal? So the quality at most restaurants is going to be adulterated because most restaurants are thinking about profit. The way that we cook at home, whether it's with our chicken or with our bone broth, that bone broth is beef bone broth is typically cooked over a 24 hour period to simmer for 24 hours. And that is what pulls out those umami flavors naturally. If you go to the restaurants, what they'll do, especially Asian restaurants who are eat, who are cooking and making pho, what you'll often have is you'll have them use these bouillon cubes almost, where it's again, full of flavor additives and flavor enhancers and MSG. I've seen them at the Asian restaurant supply stores and they just turn them around. And this is what they're using because it's a lot more profitable for them. Mm -hmm. If we're out at restaurants because, you know, the family wants it. And if they really are craving for pho and I haven't done my job to prepare ahead of time and we'll go out, I'll tell the children, you can have the pho, but don't drink the broth. And that's one of the things that's the most ironic because that is the most nourishing part of eating pho is drinking the broth. And we can do that when we eat out. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you for that word of warning and that reminder. Um, I had no idea about those little semi bouillon cube things going on there because when I eat out, I think, oh, this should be so nourishing. It's traditional, but it's very different in terms of quality. So thank you for that. And now I want to post you the question I like to pose at the end, Sophie, and then perhaps we'll have the members ask a few questions here as well. If the listener could just do one thing to improve their health, what would you recommend that they do? I think just starting one recipe and cook from scratch, even if it's a simple dish like cooking rice, try that, cook it with broth, cook it on the stove, add a little bit of butter or some ghee in there, but start 
with one recipe and simplify it. And I think that's what I aspire to do with the Nourishing Asian Kitchen is to make it so, so simple because I can understand with a lot of people coming to me beforehand and saying, this is really delicious, but I'm very intimidated. This is something that I wrote with my mom while I was working full time at startup companies and not having a lot of time. So you can do it and you can do it with limited ingredients and not having to go to the Asian grocery store. That's right. Because I think you even have some suggestions in the cookbook, as I recall, for places where you can get spices that and ways in which you can combine spices to get the flavors that you want without getting too fancy and out there. Absolutely. Yeah. My career has been in optimization and it's carried through the way I cook too. So I'm always thinking about what are the minimum amount of steps and ingredients that I can use to maximize for nutrient density for health and healing for our family. I love that. Well, thank you so much, Sophie. Thank you so much for having me, Hilda. Our guest today was Sophia Nguyen Eng. Visit her website, sprinklewithsoil.com to learn more. And I am Hilda Labrador-Gore, the host and producer of this podcast for the Weston A. Price Foundation. You can find me at holistichilda.com. And for the transcript for this episode, visit our website, westonaprice.org and click on the podcast page. And now for a recent review from Tim CMT. On Apple Podcasts, Tim CMT said, intelligent and upbeat, phenomenal podcast. I learned so much from Hilda and her questions. Plus she has a light voice and an upbeat attitude. The March 4th, 2024 episode is outstanding. Thank you so much for this review, Tim CMT. This means a lot. I had no idea my voice came across that way. Please tell my family so. (laughs) And thank you so much for listening, my friend. Stay well and remember to keep your feet on the ground and your face to the sun. On behalf of the Weston A. Price Foundation, thanks for listening. We have many free resources to support you on your health journey. Visit WestonAPrice.org to find podcasts, articles, videos, and more. You can also find a local chapter near you for help in finding sources of great food. We invite you to support the Foundation's mission of education, research, and activism by becoming a member. Thanks again, and take care. Wise Traditions is a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. The content on this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or other healthcare professional. It is not intended to be, nor does it constitute healthcare or medical advice.